that vacuum cleaner fixed yet, McGee? No, and I've been working on it all day. And all I can see wrong with it is there's a little gadget missing off the thing in the jig there that goes under the what's it behind the hoop nanny here. <laughs> yes, I know. I told you that before you started. You did? Certainly, but you wouldn't listen. You just kept saying, what do women know about mechanics? And you brushed me off. Well, they don't know anything about mechanics. As a matter of fact, women don't know much about anything. Why, Gibber McGee, how you can Oh, they're stand. sweet and nice and all that, but when it comes down to actually doing things, it takes a man. Over the course of the time the U.S. was in World War II, 13 million men left to go fight. This left many created war jobs empty. All women were called to work. They built ships, planes, and much more. The icon for these women was Rosie the Riveter, who represented feminism in the workforce. This revolutionary propaganda campaign portrayed women as strong and happy with the contributions to the war effort. Though reactions were mixed, women produced 300,000 airplanes, 3,300 warships, and inspected 44 billion rounds of ammunition. Although most women were fired after the war, their daughters remembered their mothers working and grew up to become a vital part of the workforce. There's an old stereotype that says a woman's place is in the home. Women throughout U.S. history haven't had a lot of choices for work. Single women could be nurses or teachers. Once you got married, you had to quit your job and stay at home to take care of your children and your husband. World War I had a similar impact on women's employment, but not at the same level of impact as World War II. While the first generation of college-educated women entered professions in the 1920s, they found opportunities only in nurturing women's professions, such as nursing, teaching, social work, and within medicine and pediatrics. This was much the same for women's professions in the 1930s and 1940s, as women primarily pursued careers in these same professions, with the addition of factories. While male factory workers on federal contracts in 1920 started at 40 cents an hour, women started at 20 cents. Very few women were allowed to work in factories in the 1920s, but during World War II, women were expected and needed in the factories. To demonstrate the growth of women's employment, consider that even after World War I in the 1920s, Women composed only 24% of the labor force. During World War II and the 1940s, women composed nearly 37% of the workforce. In the 1930s, society viewed working women as un-American thieves, stealing jobs from men who needed them to support their families. Mrs. Samuel Gompers proclaimed, A home, no matter how small, is large enough to occupy a wife's mind and time. She called women working outside of the home unnatural. Like many children in the 30s, Glennie Brow did not know of any woman in the workforce. 3% of all women in the country were gainfully employed. 3 out of every 10 of these working women were in domestic or personal service. Of professional women, 3 quarters were school teachers. Fashion also inhibited them from doing men's jobs. They wore things like dresses and suits that were basically one piece attached to a skirt. These restricted certain movements, like building planes or riveting. Women who did work at the time did jobs like being maids or working on an assembly line in a factory. But this all changed on December 7, 1941. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. With all the men off to war, there was no unemployment. It was just the opposite. So many jobs were open, women went on door-to-door -door campaigns to get others to help. The U.S. government made posters with slogans such as, We can do it! And the more women at work, the sooner we win. The women on these posters are strong, yet feminine, which helped recruit six million women who built many things vital to the war. At the height of the war, there were 19,170,000 women in the labor force. Between 1940 and 1945, the female labor force grew by 50%. Although in the beginning, the government's campaign targeted single women, they soon had to move to married women because of the large need for more women at work. Though a popular example of a wartime woman worker, Rosie, did more than 
just ribbon. Women of all ages operated large cranes, which were used to move heavy tanks and artillery. Some women loaded and fired machine guns and other weapons to make sure they worked. Other women operated hydraulic presses, while some worked as volunteer firefighters. Some women, who formerly worked as maids or waitresses, took over more essential jobs such as welders, riveters, jill press operators, and taxi cab drivers. Women found themselves participating in every aspect of the war industry, making military clothing or building fighter jets. American women worked day and night. Companies, and particularly male supervisors, were not experienced hiring women and certainly were not prepared for the growth of women in the workforce. In July, a 1943 issue of the Transportation Magazine, the following article was published, A 1943 Guide to Hiring Women. According to the preface, this article is written for male supervisors of women in the workforce during World War II. The article provides 11 tips on getting more efficiency out of women employees. Following are a few of these 11 tips that highlight the level of ignorance and unpreparedness of male supervisors. Number one, pick young married women. They usually have more of a sense of responsibility than their unmarried sisters. They're less likely to be flirtatious. They need the work or they wouldn't be doing it. They still have the pep and interest to work hard and work with the public efficiently. Number three, general experience indicates that Husky girls, those that are a little on the heavy side, are more even-tempered and efficient than their underweight sisters. Number eight, give every girl an adequate number of rest periods during the day. You may have to make some allowances for female psychology. A girl has more confidence and is more efficient if she can keep her hair tidy, apply fresh lipstick, and wash her hands several times a day. Although these jobs got a ton of glory, they had their downsides. Women had to wear pants so they would not get their dresses caught in machinery. Many men did not take this. They would not open the door for women in pants or offer them their seat on the bus. If women worked, they were called bad mothers, but if they did not work, they were considered unpatriotic. Also, the pay was unfair. Men were paid $45.60 a week, and women were only paid $31.10 a week. The war front brought the good and bad out of everyone. After World War II, the men came home and most of the women were fired. They went from welding to punching a typewriter. Women lost their jobs they had worked so hard at, just because the men came home. In S Detroit, 72% of women who were laid off after the war wanted to keep on working. Three million women were laid off. Dallas Tomisto worked during World War II. She quit her job after so many servicemen came home. So I worked at that, then I must have worked on that till almost 1946 or late 45, after the war ended anyway. And um, so then there was a lot of servicemen coming home from the service and all looking for jobs. And they suggested us women that we should give up our jobs and for, for the, these servicemen. And um, so I, I decided, to, because I had my three kids and my sister wanted to get on without taking care of kids who wanted to do something else. The next generation of women and girls remembered their mothers working, so they started to work. Women were no longer viewed as soft, sensitive, and weak. They proved that they could do work better or just as good as men. Those women helped impact the women working today. In 1963, the Equal Pay Act was passed. In 1964, Title VII banned discrimination and employment in the basis of race, gender, and religion. Today, 50% of working Americans are women. Thanks to Rosie the Riveter, women have value in the workforce. Nowadays, no one would think twice about a woman working in a factory or being a CEO of a large company. This is because of the women on the workforce during World War II who helped inspire the generations to come. The Rosie the Riveters of World War II affected women all over the world. They showed that women shouldn't be pushed aside to be housewives. They should be able to do work, just like men. The famous We Can Do It poster inspired many women of different races, religions, and backgrounds to stand up for what they believe in. Rosie's presence is still visible in the world today.